Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Link, and I am the head of scholarly programs at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's discussion with Greg Garrett and Sam Corin on Waterworks, Wilds, and the Wealth Divide, the role of lay people in stormwater management in Providence, Rhode Island. We're very glad to have you with us here today in this virtual space. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over one and a half million dollars in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check our website, www.amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. Today's program marks the first in a series of discussions highlighting citizen science projects across the nation and follows on the Society's Spring Symposium on the promise and pitfalls of citizen science. Inspired by the Society's 2021 exhibition, Dr. Franklin, a Citizen Scientist, the symposium explored understandings of citizen science over time, placing historical initiatives in conversation with present day projects, as well as reflecting on the future needs and opportunities of the movement. Recordings from the symposium are now available for viewing on our website and on, you, on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to check those out after today's event. We're using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, uh, you've all been muted. If you have a question, we encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. Uh, and you can type your question in, at, in there at any time during today's discussion. Uh, we'll have time at the end of the panel uh, for questions with our speakers. Finally, we are excited to offer closed captioning for this event. To use it, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It is to the right of the Q&A button. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers. Greg Garrett has been a cutting edge environmental and social radical since he organized his high school for the first Earth Day in 1970. Currently involved in exploration and activism around the ecology ec economy interface, urban agriculture, compost, river restoration, restoring amphibian pop populations, documenting urban wildlife, green politics, and the administration of the Coalition of Environmental Organizations in Rhode Island, uh, Garrett has been the leading advocate in Rhode Island for making sure ecology is a component of efforts to create a sustainable economy. Joining him is Sam Corrin, public scholar, creative practitioner, PhD candidate, and affiliate of the Institute at Brown for Environmental and for Environment and Society, with a lifelong interest in the history and natures of cities. Sam is currently working on a dissertation titled Watershed Metropolis, a 50-year history of Rhode Island's urban rivers. He is exhibited, uh, he is exhibited as, as a research-based artist exploring humans' relationships to distressed landscapes, and is currently serving as co-organizer with Doors Open Rhode Island on an exhibition titled Providence Waterways. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg, who will be the first presenter for today's event. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Garrett. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I live not far from Route 1, and Route 1 um, was the path that the Narragansetts used to go from Providence's waterfront to Pawtucket's waterfront for thousands of years. Um, speaking of Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin created the post road. Route one was part of the post road. Those of you who are from New England and the East Coast know about the post road, know about Route one. And um, so I'm a proud liver near Route one. Um, it's where we started this craziness. Um, 
I moved to Rhode Island 25 years ago and somehow immediately got tangled up in two projects. One was I was recruited immediately to my neighborhood association board. And the second, I ended up active with the Environment Council of Rhode Island. I served in various places with the Environment Council of Rhode Island for many years as a VP in Cloud. And then 19 years ago, I started working for them. And, and so I, I do that. But the first thing I ever did in Rhode Island was I started walking downtown from my house and you walk along the Meshassic watershed and you end up downtown and the Meshassic River is among the oldest industrial rivers in the world. It was an industrial river back in 1675. Um, there's a grain mill that was right at the edge of where the water falls into the bay, the last little cataract before it goes into the tide water. But that last stretch of the Meshassic River looked like hell, even though it's like all walled like the Blackstone Canal that it was 200 years ago. So that's the work, my watershed, you know, um, just it needed friends. So we started Friends of the Meshassic. Then 10, probably 12 years ago, um, I realized that the burial ground, the North burial ground, the 300 plus year old cemetery in my neighborhood, right along Main Street, um, the National Guard has a deeded right to, to, to work in there, to, to work out in there and train in there. And they were um, doing that, but the cemetery was locked all the time, except for the drive-in gate at the far end. So they would just cut the chain every month so they could go in there and do their work. And um, I went to the parks department as part of my neighborhood association delegation and said, you know, the National Guard's cutting the lock, open the place up. They did. It's been closed since the pandemic and the new administration isn't gonna open it. And I keep protesting that, but, but they did that. They opened it. I started going in there and um, I've been doing environmental work as, as I said now for 50 years. So for, you know, I got in there and I start walking around. And of course, if you know anything about the environment, you know that water is life. So one day in the spring, I'm looking at this little pool. It's basically a big puddle. Um, it holds water some, it holds water, you know, it goes dry some. I look in there and there's these little black tadpoles and they were cute, you know, little black tadpoles are really kind of neat. So I started going, I started watching them. And um, I said, somebody should make a video of um, these, these tadpoles. And so I went around looking for somebody else to do it. And nobody else could do it. And I've never owned a camera, but at 59 years old, I um, basically said, I'm going to do this. I will um, make videos of these, of these um, tadpoles. So that's what I started doing. So and since 2013, I've been making videos of the tadpoles. And then it just went from there, from studying the tadpoles. And I have a video out there called Six Weeks and 90 Seconds. You can see from, from birth to, to little toads that hop away. It's an 84 second video. I, made, I kept making videos. I have made a thousand videos. Not all of them of this pond, but I branched out to all of the um, all of the wildlife in the burial ground and now even more beyond that in the watershed. So I have video of animals from the size of microscopic to the size of a coyote and a bald eagle. And so that's what I started doing. And after I like mastered how a tadpole develops and you'll see various tadpole videos in a little bit because it's a video project, you ought to see some video. And so what's happened is, is that, um, I had to become an expert on the tadpoles. And so I actually probably one of the experts in the world on, on Fowler's toad breeding cycles, because I probably spent more time actually watching Fowler's toads the last 10 years than anybody else on the planet. Um, we developed the Green Infrastructure Coalition. I am um, a stormwater person from back, way back. One of the first things I did in Rhode Island was convince the Narragansett Bay Commission, the local sewer district, that they needed to put in green infrastructure in their big plan for how to manage stormwater in Rhode Island. They hated the idea. We busted their chops 
and it, it made it into the pro it made it into their final plan. In fact, they actually took what I wrote and just copied it over so that we could all so I would vote for the plan. I did vote for the plan. They put it in the, the sewer, the, the underground tunnel has reduced the, the pollution in the bay from nitrogen by 90%. And um, they're still working on phase three, which includes a lot of green infrastructure. The more I studied these tadpoles, the more I, I love them. I finally, after years, got to really understand them. And then I understood it as a green infrastructure system because it collects the rainwater from about three or four acres of hillside, all highly eroded. It's, it's in bad shape because it's got um, too much silt. I'm not sure what's ever gonna happen in terms of it's filling up and it may no be, be no longer good for, for tadpole. We've done some experiments there. We've trained, we, we got the idea of restoring habitat with green infrastructure for cleaner stormwater for amphibians out into the public and people are now doing spade foot toad restoration and all of them came to my conference. So I'm pretty happy about that. I'm going to share a couple of my screen soon, and I am going to put on a couple of, uh, I got six short videos. I'm going to just show you some quick parts of it so you can see the toads. You can see here the, the sonic experience at night when you go hear the breeding is just amazing. And we'll start with that. I need to uh, share my screen here. Share screen. Okay, here we go. I hope people can hear me when I'm talking. I don't know if I'm muted or what when I share my screen. Um, this one has tree frogs as well. Most of the callers that you're hearing are fowler's toads, but the trills are gray tree frogs. This is the first night that the tree frogs have been evidence in among the fowler's toads. This one has tadpoles a couple weeks after they start. By June 2nd, Fowler's Toad tadpoles have been hatching for about two weeks. You can see the various size classes. The smallest ones are the youngest. The largest ones have been around for about two weeks. The little ones start off at about a quarter inch. The bigger ones now are probably just about a half inch. This one's amazing. Tadpoles eat by scraping algae and bacteria off of leaves with moderate Okay, I am back. Um, what you saw was breeding night, followed by tadpoles, 
followed by some tadpole behavior. Um, the, the, how they eat just fascinated me for a while. And, you know, it's like, first you learn the anatomy, then you learn how they develop, then you learn how they behave. Tadpoles, Fowler's toad tadpoles are kind of amazing. They live in these large groups, but um, they don't actually um, do anything socially. They seem to have absolutely no comprehension of each other as, as beings. They bang into each other almost randomly. Anything that touches them, they kind of flail around. So they're always banging into each other. It's really kind of amazing. Anyways, um, the pool itself is really amazing. And I'm going to share my screen this time without giving you computer video because it's a silent video. And I'm just gonna point out things as they go by. Let me see how I do this. Okay, share screen, share sound, share. I made this video as a silent video. Normally I would, um, you heard some of them, they, I, I narrate my videos, I put some music on it. This one I said, I don't know if I can share the sound, we'll see what I got. This is tadpoles. They are eating, they are living on the bottom of the pond. Fowler's toad tadpoles love to sit at the lowest point. This is the pond. This is what I call the rainwater pool. This is this last week, it was dry as a bone. This is what it looks like when it's full in the winter or in the fall or the spring or something. It's a working cemetery and um, this is a busy road. I come in the winter, I come all year round. I take video at least 200 days a year. One year I made a video of this thing and showed how it reacted to the rainfall. It, re it reacts almost exactly with the rainfall. So um, that's, that's what it does from another. This is that same perspective. And you know the, the cattails have marched across and now dominating. And between that and the amount of siltation, this is a, a night scene where, you know, you would see the tadpole, you, this would be where the tadpoles are, you know, the, the toads and tree frogs are calling. Red-winged blackbird always lives at this pond. Um, let's see, where am I? Oh, this is what it looks like right now. Um, it's pretty bad at times. Um, this is a sign we made for the Green Infrastructure Coalition, explaining this as a place where it holds water that drains off of this hillside. And oh, this is one of the most amazing things. How many of you know anything about the formation of deltas? This is a delta. There's actually about five or six channels that are historical from the last few years. Every time one of these gets created and then it fills up and then it, it overflows another place and it creates a new channel. So um, that is, it's, it's just an amazing, if you want to do a geology lesson, that is the place. I wanted to show you some toads. This is what they look like. They are calling like crazy. Um, that line down the back is how you know it's a fowler's toad. It's pretty, I do do a flashlight and I think my, my niece was, old. this is something you saw before that it's a set of steps out in the far end of the room, a, a far end of the pond. And they actually just, um, it goes crazy there. Um, and and this, these steps are, are amazing. They jig under there. This is the tadpoles again, and um, it's it's just a phenomenal project. I take I used to give tours, but with the cemetery closed at night, I can't give tours for the toads. Oh, and this is just a reminder of what else is in there. There's a coyote in the in the distance, and uh, they're amazing. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There, I have shared my screen. I might show you one more coyote video. The real issue about this is how do you get this done? I think I'm getting run out of time. Um, yes, I am starting to lose it. And uh, it's about time to, 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 I forgot to tell you what Sam is going to do. So here's what Sam is going to do. Sam will share some thoughts on how the history of redevelopment in Providence has literally paved the way for the city's current social and ecological conditions. Sam will then showcase a handful of community-based organizations that aim to restore the city's wetlands and just as crucially restore people's relationship to those wetlands and other green spaces of the city. 
I wish I could have spent more time talking to you about how the crazy process of, of dealing with the, the bureaucracy and getting this kind of project through is. is. Um, I will say though, I've been successful enough that the, the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management has um, got new guidelines on how to work with citizen groups doing restoration. And I think I'm done and I will get out of the way let Sam go and happy to answer questions anytime. Take care. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, I'm going to just take a second to share screen here. And um, yeah, so as Adriana mentioned, um, I'm a, a PhD candidate um, at Brown, but I'm also a Rhode Island resident. I grew up in the Providence area and um, I've been here for most of my life. Um, Let's see. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, just to follow from, from Greg's talk, um, is sort of give you some context for, for why this, this um, the, the persistence in life of the toads and, and uh, all the other wild creatures in this, in this particular patch of the city is, is really quite amazing. Um, because if you, if you have a sense for the, the history of, of the built environment um, and, and the stressors on, on uh, wildlife in this place, um, um, it really puts things in perspective. So um, I assume everyone can see my screen. Um, so yeah, to sort of start at that granular neighborhood level, um, I get very confused about how things connect um, in the north end of, of Providence, the city of my birth. It's not that I find myself getting lost as can happen along the narrow meshwork streets of pre-World War II neighborhoods to the south, like Federal Hill, Onlyville, or even parts of Smith Hill. That kind of confusion stems from an overabundance of possible routes. In the industrial North End, by contrast, I find myself getting routed because most diversions from the big main roads hit eventual dead ends. Things don't connect because the district's several throughways and highways act like so many border walls. In contrast to many older parts of the city where there are a half dozen ways to arrive at any one destination. This is a landscape of ancient valleys and rivers, but the rivers especially get lost in the built overlay. Who would know, for example, that the West River flows in a ditch behind a stop and shop? Or that for a sneeze's length of time on I-95, you're driving over the buried Meshasek River. Not all of the city's waterways are so forlorn. The downtown waterfront along the Providence River attracts visitors from around the region with its linear parks, pedestrian bridges, festivals, and public art along with recent efforts at habitat restoration for native plants and fauna. The nearby Winnesquatucket River, once a dead zone, has become a cherished site for surrounding communities with its public parks and trails. The Winnesquatucket River Watershed Council has removed dams and built fish ladders, and fish are returning to spawn in the river's waters for the first time in centuries. Here's, uh, here's some of those fish. The West River, by contrast, carves to the North End little noticed with scarcely any points of public access. It weaves invisibly beneath high-speed roads and industrial property lines, at certain points reduced to a mere culvert. In the no, in the no man's land between two highway, highway ramps off Branch Avenue, it converges with another similarly small and embattled river called the Meshasek, which takes its name from the Narragansett word, meaning where the moose drink. Maybe they'll come back someday, those moose, but they've long been gone from the river's banks and from the region. The underground is a term that Rosemary Claire Collard and Jessica Dempsey adopt for forms of life and labor that are necessary to the continuance of capitalist societies, but kept, kept off the ledgers as it were, recognized as useful, but unvalued. In the realm of human labor, the authors applied the term to the unwaged work of social reproduction especially as performed by women. But the concept can also be used in reference to non-human natures. The underground encompasses freely available services or work provided by ecosystems, a kind of national international infrastructure needed for liberal capitalist operation. From carbon sequestration in the case of forests to food crop pollination in the case of bees. The urban wetlands of the West River and the Meshasek are one such underground. You won't find them on most visitors bureau guide maps, 
but they still do labor for the city. They absorb and flush stormwater from the surrounding hills and valleys. Their wetlands, cool surrounding streets, absorb excess carbon and collect trash. They provide medicines and herbs, and they might one day again become a source of food. Their invisible, their invisible banks also provide shelter for people with nowhere else to go. Along the river's edges these days are so many traces of human occupation, tents, clothes, books, and even baby toys. Everywhere beyond the sight lines of the surrounding streets, the city's wetlands are a haven for residents who have become outcast surplus, to borrow another of Collard and Dempsey's terms, amidst a chronic shortage of affordable housing that is region-wide. Historian Richard White wrote of the Columbia River that it's at once our creation and retains a life of its own beyond our control. In the case of the Mishasic and West Rivers, that life was denied for most of the 19th century and some of the 20th as the waterways were yoked both as power sources and provisional sewers. Sprawling mills and mill villages rose to harness these powers. And where they rose, the rivers were literally, literally worked to death. Bleacheries, textile mills, slaughterhouses, and sewage outflows choked and toxified their waters. As one journalist remarked in 1916 of the Mishasic, none but a tin fish with a double coat of non-corrosive paint could live in it. It must have been hard not to notice the rivers in those years, not only because they smelled awful, took on the colors of dyes, and flowed with slaughterhouse blood, but because of the life and labor of the whole district oriented to them, for better or worse. Gradually, however, with the decline of industry and then decisively at the hands of officials and planners, the city turned away from the rivers and it hasn't turned back. Much of the old North End where the Mishasic and West Rivers run was raised and leveled in the late 1950s. The city's 1946 master plan for land use and population distribution declared that the new industrial sites should be established in the valley bottoms on land now largely occupied by bad housing a strategy meant to kill two birds with one bulldozer, namely the, <laughs> namely the flight of industry and the quote unquote blight of low income multiracial neighborhoods. Development area D7, and this is not a perfectly accurate map of where that is, but it's close. As a slice of the North End was known in city planning documents, was home to about 3000 residents occupying 500 buildings on 50 acres. The neighborhood was working class and multi-ethnic with residents including Irish, Poles, Italians, and by the 1950s, African-Americans. Um, this is, it's hard to find pictures of the old North End. So this is actually a neighborhood in South Providence um, that, was, that was cleared um, around the same time as part of another urban renewal project, as many of the neighborhoods in the city were. To justify the displacement of so many people, the Providence Redevelopment Agency cited the neighborhood's difficult topography, irregular street pattern, and quote, social inad inadequacy, the last point referring to higher than average cases of tuberculosis, quote, illegitimate births, and general public assistance cases. The West River Industrial Park, designed to attract corporate interests that demanded easy access to highways, was the first development of its kind in New England. It took the city five years to clear the area, to fill the old cellar holes, regroom the land, and sell off the massive new parcels to buyers, including Westinghouse, Intellect Systems, and Mack Trucks. Most had relocated from other parts of the city, and they would have likely moved away were it not for the availability of these newly emptied parcels. With this in mind, the city declared West River a resounding success. It was thus that the district's narrow streets, mills, tenements, and railroads were made to give way to what is there today a sprawl of low-rise buildings, big, bo big box commercial strips, parking lots, and two highways. The West River Industrial Park paved the way, literally, as the first big step in this direction. Those who built it paved over the wetlands and hemmed its namesake river into hidden trenches and culverts. Ironically, in so doing, they also finalized the long incoming break of industry from the working waterways. 60 years later, the built environment still turns away from them and the circuits of daily life for most people do not connect to them. In terms of necessities like food, clothing, and shelter, they just don't matter much, or so it would seem. We're more connected to Indonesian palm oil farms, Brazilian soy fields, Canadian tar sands, and countless other elsewheres than these rivers that only register for many of us as thin blue lines on GPS maps. 
And in these parts of the city that orient to the highways, the landscape as habitat for humans and non-humans alike remains an afterthought. And yet it is along this built overlay where for many residents, the labor of making a life unfolds. Speaking for myself, it's easy to lock into that blacktop world of convenient quantifiable things, a kind of default niche, it's where most of my daily needs are met. I know how to navigate it, how to read its geography of traffic lights, painted lines, squared entrances and aisles, in contrast to the wild spaces in between, where I feel more alive, but profoundly ignorant, clumsy, and a little lost. I may not like going, I may not like going to the local strip mall, um, but after so many years of reluctant returns, the built environs of consumer society have become my habitat. And yet it's not everything, nor has it devoured everything, nor could it. There are whole hidden worlds pressing into this one. On walks with my partner, we've seen hawks, blue herons, isnea, turkey tail mushrooms, wild grapes, and many other forms of life that I cannot name. Um, as Greg's documented, there are blue jays, crows, kingfishers, falcons, hawks, osprey, otters, muskrats, turtles, and frogs in the beleaguered North End. They live near auto salvage yards, freight yards, dollar stores, drive throughs and because we're preconditioned not to see them, they're easy to miss. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes that restoring land without restoring relationship is an empty exercise. It is relationship that will endure, relationship that will sustain the restored land. Therefore, reconnecting people in the landscape is as essential as reestablishing proper hydrology or cleaning up contaminants. It is medicine for the earth. Decades of ag advocacy have proven that some measure of wetlands restoration is possible. And thanks to groups like Friends of the Meshasic, that work has already begun. The question, it seems to me, as someone who's recently joined in these efforts, is whether and how the underground, that realm of forgotten natures, and the above ground, that realm of necessary goods and wages, will finally weave together again. Is it possible to bridge across these fragmentary codependent worlds <clears throat> rather than choosing falsely as with world past, which to sweep away? So that's the first half of, um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. That's the first half of um, uh, my portion of the presentation. Um, and I hope it's, it's useful just to, um, just to put in context, you know, what's at stake and, and how, um, how important and precarious really these um, restoration efforts are. Um, in the second half, I wanna showcase some of the people and organizations that are involved in wetlands restoration here in Providence, um, especially uh, those groups whose work recognizes that res restoration is about relationship um, and affirms the continuity between uh, questions of social equity and environmental stewardship. <clears throat> so just to give you uh, <clears throat> a look at Providence at large, because we've been kind of talking about the North End for the most part, uh, Providence is a city of about 180,000 people in a metro area of about 1,600,000. It's the third most populous city in New England, and it's the capital city of Rhode Island, which is home to the original nations of the Narragansett, Wampanoag, Niantic, Pequot, Nipmuc, and Poconocet peoples. Um, here's just some more city picks. Um, a lot of geese in the downtown area. Um, and, you know, Providence was an industrial city um, and it's, it's, it's long sort of moved on from, from that, um, that phase of its development. Um, and these days it's, it's still very densely built, densely populated and compact. Um, and much of the city, unfortunately, is, is, is paved. Um, so the problems of the North End, um, you know, over paving and lack of tree canopy are endemic to other parts of the city, especially those that are home to lower income and minority residents. And here you can see a visualization of, of um, impervious surface. And as you can probably guess, the, the um, you know, kind of goes from a spectrum of beige to, to dark red, dark brown. And those are the, you know, those are the parts of the map that um, have the most impervious surface. And as you can see, the, the center city is, is um, really the most afflicted. Um, some other visual, visualizations of that, these are um, maps from Groundwork Rhode Island uh, from a story map called Climate Safe Neighborhoods. 
Um, and you can see here uh, tree canopy distribution. And again, you know, in the center of the city, uh, the North End, but also South Providence, uh, the West End, um, that's where there's the least, um, the least cover. Another way to slice that, another way to look at that is, um, you know, um, me, uh, mean surface temperature in different neighborhoods. And again, you can see the city center is, is uh, among the hottest areas of the metro area. Um, again, you know, just showing how these things um, correspond, uh, land surface temperature and impervious surface um, tend to, um, uh, high, land, high land surface temperature and extensive impervious surface um, tend to correlate with uh, low tree canopy cover. Um, this is just a close up of uh, more or less around the North End um, showing how it is one of those areas of the city that's afflicted in this way. Um, so as I was mentioning, these, these maps are from a group called Groundwork Rhode Island. Um, and, um, and I guess in showcasing uh, the work of, of local organizations, I'll begin with Groundwork. And um, I'll, I'll begin actually, I had a conversation yesterday with Kufa Castro, who's program coordinator with Groundwork. Think it, who's been leading the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Project in the near, nearby cities of Central Falls and, and Pawtucket. And um, I'm showing you this clip where Kufa, Kufa was responding to the question of, why is it important for youth to connect to the waterways and open spaces of the city? So I'll play that now. I think it, it serves, um, anytime I go to the waterway or, or, I, or I, I see how even they react when we go like just how much they relax and like you can see it in their body bodies their shoulders going down like it's a it's, it's a way of meditation it's also if if you can fish in the in that in, in, in that area like seeing other people fish like that's that's a way also to you know to to get a um to have more access to food to you know to local food and and that that environment but um yeah so i i think it's important in those ways and and, and, and these communities, which are feeling the effects of climate change the most, like, I don't think they, if they, if, if they are not doing those, those interactions uh, early on and, and ongoing, um, you know, they won't be the people on the ground uh, trying to, to solve their own problems, you know, uh, or, or changing their own, uh, their own environment. Because if I feel like those connections just need to be made to be able to care, um, as to, as to why am I connected to that waterway? Uh. So yeah, as I mentioned, you know, Kufa's uh, program coordinator with Groundwork, and um, uh, part of Groundwork's uh, sort of uh, constellation is uh, the Green Team Youth, and they work outdoors and engaging in physical improvement projects, and along the way, learn about various environmental sustainability efforts, and how they, as 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 youth residents of the city can be involved as leaders and activists to make local communities healthier places to live. Um, there's also um, Ground Core Landscape, which provides valuable paid hands-on work experience to graduates of a job training program as they search for permanent employment. Um, and these projects demonstrate urban landscape restoration and stormwater management best practices contributing to the health and vitality of the people and places in Rhode Island's urban communities. Another, another very active and robust group in um, the province area is the Winnesquatucket Watershed Council. Um, they've done a lot of work over um, the past 20 plus years, um, a lot of it um, involving dam remo removal and um, introduction of fishways and fish ladders. And um, you know, the idea here is to gradually return the flow of the water to pre-industrial revolution status and uh, open the, the river again to fish and eel passage. Um, and, you, and you can see that today where um, migratory fish are, are pushing up to parts of the river, parts of the Winnesquatucket that they haven't been able to access uh, for centuries. Um, one project that the Winnesquatucket Watershed Council has been working on or beginning work on is, um, is here at the Atlantic Mills Complex. This is in Olneyville, right in the Winnesquatucket River. 
Um, it's a 19th century mill that's become the site of a flea market and a furniture wholesaler um, and artist studios and a lot of um, other, other kind of um, small businesses. And they have this huge parking lot and um, the Watershed Council is helping them to um, introduce green infrastructure features that will mitigate the effects of the parking lot, including uh, bioswale and tree filter and uh, porous pavement surfaces. Um, and then another group that's doing some pretty amazing work is the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. Um, they're based in Roger Williams Park, which is the city's largest park. It's a partnership between the city of Providence, um, the Audubon Society, the Nature Conservancy, and several other groups. And um, it, you know, the Innovation Center explores strategies for improving urban water quality and associated wildlife habitat through green stormwater practices to reduce stormwater contaminants from entering the ponds, lakes, and rivers and degrading water quality. And uh, they provide hands-on training from municipalities, engineers, construction companies, scientists, um, who learn from the successes and failures of um, this network of dozens of different um, stormwater catchment uh, sites throughout the park. Um, and they also aim to educate communities nearby about stormwater and um, its effects on water quality through different volunteer monitoring programs and neighborhoods art, neighborhood arts festivals. Um, on the policy side of things, I just wanted to uh, quickly mention the climate justice plan, um, which um, Providence is the first city to have this kind of plan. A lot of cities have uh, sustainability plans. But um, this, is, this is one of the first and, and unique for the fact that it integrates um, a kind of um, social justice platform with, uh, with um, environmental stewardship and restoration. And uh, there's good reasons for that. Um, Providence is the fifth highest um, city in the nation for income inequality, uh, fifth highest in the nation for low income energy bur burden, most polluted county for air quality in the Boston Worcester Providence Metro, which is um, which is like a combined st statistical area of about six million people. Um, and you know, a really crucial thing about the climate justice plan is that it um, it it embeds this um, this model of of um, community ownership of the plans and. And, and visions um, you know, that are put in place for a given neighborhood. Um, it, it, uh, uh, an exciting feature of the plan are these green justice zones, which um, use that collaborative governance model where you know, it's community leaders who really um, have the say in what gets built and where, or what gets unbuilt for that matter. And, um, um, and where, you know, one of the first neighborhoods where that, where that will be enacted is in South Providence along the waterfront here. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the most highly polluted patches of land in the whole state. And um, what, the, what the climate justice plan calls for is implementing a green justice zone here. Um, this was uh, along the waterfront at a scrap metal yard um, where a community group called People's Port Authority was organizing a protest against a scrap metal yard. And um, this just gives you an image of, of what the waterfront could look like um, if those heavy polluting industries were phased out and if community groups had more control. This is actually downtown Providence. This is a sunflower field, but it shows you, um, you know, sort of an example of bioremediation uh, of soil using, um, using native plants. And um, I'm gonna close there because um, I do want to leave some time for questions, but um, I want to just close by saying thank you to um, all the people and groups who um, I've been able to learn from over the past several months, and, um, um, and I really appreciate all your help, and, uh, and thank you all for being here. Thank you both so much for sharing um, these really interesting complementary projects that you've been working on. I think it's been really great to see sort of Greg, your, your on the ground perspective and then Sam, your, your sort of larger lens on, on what's going on both, both in Providence, but also um, more broadly. 
Um, so I, I wanted to start our conversation today by, by kind of reflecting on this as, as a project of citizen science. You know, we're sort of thinking about this as part of our citizen science showcase. And, and, and Sam, I think you did a really lovely job of talking about some of the organizations um, that, 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 that you see as doing citizen science work. And, and Greg, obviously you're, you're kind of doing <laughs> citizen science work yourself. Um, I'd love to hear you talk more about what communities um, you're sort of engaging with as you do these projects. Greg, if you're working uh, with scientists, with school groups, um, what community members you're kind of working with on, on, on engaging your project. And then Sam, um, thinking about this in terms of your PhD, how are you, how are you sort of contextualizing citizen science as a phenomenon that, that in, in a scholarly way, but also one that has kind of an activist strain? So um, would love maybe Greg, if you, if you could talk first about um, what, what people you're working with and then we'll turn it to Sam. Sure. Um... I'm one of those people who tends to work by themselves a lot, but um, I do what I call toad tours. So I would just send out on an email list to my neighborhood association and all the people I send videos to and say, I'm going out to look at the toads tonight. You want to come? Um, some of the most fun times was in pouring rain when I had a bunch of seven-year-old girls. And um, it was the only time in my life I have ever been able to say to somebody seriously, you're shrieking so loud that you will wake the dead. They were having such fun playing with the toads. And, and that. But yeah, I, I, I go to schools whenever I can. I don't get many invitations. I don't go look for them. But um, there are schools in the watershed that I work with somewhat. Um, they happen to have an affinity to, to salt marsh restoration. So working with me is pretty easy for them. Um, I do, something I did the other day was I used that knowledge of, of amphibians to, to in intervene in a development project in the nearby town right near the river. And, you know, I wrote a letter to DEM and I went to the hearing and it looks like the developer is going to keep as wetlands the entire back of the property and possibly even like create a path for people to walk through. And we've offered to help. But um, I started the project by myself. I keep doing this and, and you know, making videos is pretty much an individual thing. And, um, you know, and, and when I need help, I, I ask for it, but, you know, mostly it's stuff I do. Um, you know, the idea of working more with community groups fits everything. And, you know, I was on my neighborhood association board, so that, that was always a connection. But, um, you know, working in a cemetery that's kind of far from, you know, it's like, it's, it's not the easiest, place, even though it's right in the city and right on the main road and right next to the interstate. I mean, that's one of the reasons my videos never have the, the background sound is because the background is I-95 and it's just, ugh. But um, yeah. That and you know, and, and there's a, a question from somebody, and they were talking about you know, cemeteries are a critical ecological resource for cities and actually everywhere, and they are especially good for amphibians because at night they don't have cars, most of them have water features, and there's at least some open space. I'll stop there. Yeah, I thanks for the question. Um, I guess on the you know, as when it comes to citizen science. What I've noticed in um, volunteering and, and taking part in different groups, uh, meetings and events in the past several months is that um, there's this tremendous desire to to share in the in the gathering of data and in the um, in the practices of of um, science on the ground. You know, um, like the Stormwater Innovation Center, um, it's a small group of people, but they're so they're so enthusiastic and it's, you know, it's really a central part of what they do to bring in residents. You know, it's, it's they're not only concerned with, well, did we filter the water? Did we do a good job of, of reducing paved surface? It's really about, um, you know, have we um, sort of changed people's relationship to, to, um, to the wetlands, to the, to the local ecologies. And I think that's true for um, all kinds of collaborations uh, that are happening here. You know, the, um, on the on the south side, like I mentioned, you know, Allen's Ave and Port to Port of Providence. Um, a lot of the work that is being done there is supported by um, research into uh, rates of asthma and um, and you know 
lack of tree canopy and, and so on. You know, work that's being done by public health uh, researchers and sociologists, um, and then feeding back, you know, and, and, and neighborhood people sort of making that data their own and, and le leveraging it to, to change policy uh, is another kind of citizen science of sorts. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's such a, um, it's a notable difference between, you know, the way institutional sciences are, are sometimes, um, you know, performed, which is, which is to sort of create a wall between the expert and the lay person. Um, here, those walls are very thin. No, that's great. And, and really interesting to your point about just how many different, um, different types of communities and expertise are sort of involved in, in asking and engaging with these kinds of questions, uh, which actually leads me nicely to, to this question, uh, which is thinking about these, these neighborhood associations that you're both talking about. Um, and, and I got the sense too from you, Greg, that you really wanted to get to it, but we didn't have time uh, in, in your portion of the conversation. Maybe you can reflect a little bit more on the role of, of the state of, of Rhode Island uh, in, in kind of managing and, and overseeing these, these, these projects uh, where, where state level interference uh, either helps um, build, provide the infrastructure necessary to, to support this work, or perhaps the bureaucracy um, gets in the way of, of that. Uh, of that project. So that on the one hand, and then also thinking about the, the kind of commercial side of all of this. I, I was really struck, uh, Sam, in, in the piece that was published yesterday, and, and we should uh, share a link to that in the chat, um, kind of the, the comment you make about how most people are, are more connected with, with the economies in, in, in Brazil and in other parts of the world than they are within their own local uh, you know, landscape. So, so maybe thinking about the roles of, of the economy and the state in, as, as either supporting or, or, or uh, limiting the possibilities of, of citizen science in Rhode Island. Okay. Um, as I stated, as was stated in the um, introduction, I look at the economy and the ecology. And um, these days, one of my special focuses is on the um, despicability of the real estate industry and how much damage they do and how much political influence they have. The rules for how to manage wetlands in Rhode Island are written by the legislature and the Department of Environmental Management. You get a law, you get regulations to enforce it. And the politics of wetlands is that human beings always want to live in wetlands and the government will do everything they can to help the real estate industry, including subsidy, to um, build where they want. And so on that level, the government puts most of its weight against the protection of waterways, against the protection of land. Now, there is still a lot of pushback on that. And, you know, we get the Clean Water Act, we get state laws, we get you know, the state doing regulations, and then you get the permitting process. And I've been doing way too much permitting stuff recently because, um, you know, they want to permit, you know, a, a gas facility in an EJ community. They want to put a power plant next to a river. And, you know, and so we fight all of these things. And, and the system is sort of rigged against communities it's sort of rigged for the rich all the time and has been in Rhode Island since 1793 when the fishermen at the Blackstone River at the falls of Pawtucket said, don't build a dam. We need that salmon run to survive. And um, the state of Rhode Island and the federal courts ruled against the fishermen and they built the dam that built that Slater Mill that started the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it's really clear that how how that is. And yet, you know, it gets better in some ways. It gets worse in some ways when they rewrite the wetland regulations. They're usually a little more protective. But the whole thing is really problematic because so much of the weight of government is develop the economy, build those mills. You know, when, whenever we say, you know, protect the, the environment, you know, there's a whole political party whose whole shtick is, you know, it's bad for business. When the actual data says, the more you protect the environment, the healthier your economy. So a lot of it is bogus, but, you know, it takes people like me who will say that 
anywhere and in any hearing because nobody else will, will get that blatant and clear about it to do that. And, and you know, and, and they can't really argue with me because I come with better data than they do. Sam, anything uh, to add on this point? Um, no, I, I think I think Greg has more experience than I do with state level um, politics and policy, but it does seem to me, I can say at least that it seems like there's, you know, the state is a very big and slow ship to move. Whereas um, at the city level, there's, there's a lot of exciting things happening. And, um, um, you know, there, there are, you know, there are obstacles to community engagement there that are that are structural and 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 deep and stubborn. But um, you know, as I was mentioning with the climate justice plan um, and 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 many other things that are happening um, at the city level, um, it seems like there is a shift in thinking away from the the kind of um, unfortunate and false divide between you know, well, there's the you know, we have to think about the environment, but but. But the economy comes for us, you know. Th thinking of those things separately, it seems like maybe there's a, there's a, a shift in, or the germs of the beginning of a shift in thinking, um, you know, at the at the local level of governance. I will jump in just to say I agree with Sam. I have been very active on the local level, and you know, the climate justice plan and all the the, the previous plans and getting the city to put in more gardens and all of that. So the city is more amenable to those changes, probably demographically as well as politically, than the rest of the state. But um, you know, there's progress, but it's never fast enough. It's kind of like the climate thing. We got a climate justice plan, but you know, the city hasn't like thrown out all of its gas powered trucks. Yeah, I was gonna ask you actually, if there are any particular challenges um, that either of you see coming uh, specifically from climate change um, that, I mean, on top of everything else that we've already talked about. Yes, amphibians are in serious, serious trouble. I mean, they're the most in trouble group in the world. You know, I started off with endangered species, went all over the world, and you know, and, and my work instead of that, but ended up back with amphibians and endangered species. Amphibians are endangered, climate, but between development, but climate change, the irregularity of the rainfall has definitely going to affect breeding cycles of amphibians. And amphibians have resilient systems and they're used to years where there's nothing happening, they can't breed. But you get two, three, four of those in a row and you're in big trouble, or you get a flood at the wrong time and, and they're in big trouble. So, so amphibians are absolutely in danger because of climate change. Um, yeah, I guess uh, to add to that, you know, um, Providence, let's see. So Narragansett Bay area has, um, is this correct, Greg? One of the, the fastest levels of sea level rise? Um, it does. Is it in North America or, or globally? I'm not sure. It's one of the fastest in, in, the, country, in the world because we're getting sea level rise and land subsidence at the same time. And plus we keep eating our salt marshes for, for luxury housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great, there's a great book um, by Elizabeth Rush called Rising, um, which which talks about the, the impacts of um, rising sea levels and changing coastline ecologies in different uh, parts of the US. But one chapter is about Rhode Island and, um, and she talks in depth about those, uh, those disappearing marshes. She's based in Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked a lot about Rhode Island and, and perhaps as, as a way to close because unfortunately we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, based on based on all of the work that you've done, um, either videoing uh, toad communities or, or working with community organizers, are there particular lessons or takeaways that you see as, as being sort of transportable to other other cities, other contexts? Um, I mean, I, I think that we get the sense that, that that climate justice is very much a local event that needs to happen. But but what 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 lessons do you have for our viewers who are perhaps watching, uh, you know, from Philadelphia, uh, where the American Philosophical Society is based, or elsewhere? Um, I guarantee that there are people doing the same kind of work that Sam is talking about and that I'm talking about everywhere. You know, 
Watershed groups have national links. There's watershed groups. I went to a meeting um, somewhere in Pennsylvania and you know, I ended up meeting with the downtown development folks back then and you know they were talking about the same stuff this stuff is everywhere and and everybody's doing it the resistance is strong everywhere the real estate industry help, hates us everywhere but but you know between black lives matter and climate justice and every we're breaking down those barriers but there are people looking at alternative economies alternative environmental programs how do we do more justice everywhere and if you can't find them in your neighborhood, you ain't looking. Yeah, and I would I just add to that, you know, um, I think there are a lot of models here um, that that are that are relevant to to many different places in terms of um, sharing knowledge um, and um, and and sort of seeing how um, social justice and and ecological restoration connect on the ground because the built environment is a, is a product of, of, of the same divides that, um, you know, that, that degrade um, our, our ecosystems. Um, so, you know, just, just seeing those connections and, um, and, uh, and finding ways to, uh, you know, for, for scientists and community organizers um, and, uh, and, and neighborhood residents to uh, to collaborate. It's really it's really a great synergy that's um, that's happening here. I have one last quick quote: You cannot heal ecosystems without ending poverty. You cannot end poverty without healing ecosystems. I think those are great words to end on. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both uh, for sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise with us. Uh, I wanna remind folks that the next of our uh, Citizens Showcase uh, programs is going to be on June 16th uh, with Samantha Blickon from uh, Zooniverse. So if you're interested in learning more about that project, I encourage you to register uh, on our website. For now, um, please join me uh, from wherever you are, Providence or elsewhere, uh, in giving Sam and Greg uh, a round of applause, uh, both for these presentations and the admirable work that you've been doing uh, for so long. So thank, thank you both you again. Thank you to the Philosophical Society for inviting us. This was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks to all the people who came. Take care all.